for that. We thank you, Father, for bringing those uh, out to the church today safely, God. We thank you for watching over them throughout the highways and the byways. We thank you, Father, for your anointing. Thank you for your presence. Now, God, saturate this place with your spirit as only you can do. Father, but it's not by power nor by might, but it's by your spirit. And so, Father, I yield to your spirit even now. And Father, use me, this broken vessel, for your good and for your glory. We thank you, God, that lives shall be changed, bodies shall be healed, souls shall be saved. And this place will turn around for your goodness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you all so much for your patience. Thank you for being here this morning. I know that um, on last week, Bishop covered a lesson the week prior, and he didn't go over the lesson for last week. Lesson for last week came out of John James, excuse me, chapter three. Uh, talked about uh, your tongue, and you have to watch what you say and that kind of thing. So we're very familiar uh, with that particular text. How the tongue is a little member that can destroy the whole body. You have to be careful uh, what you say about others. You have to be careful what you say towards others because you can kill someone's purpose. You can kill uh, their destiny. You can murder them with your tongue. So you have to be careful uh, in that regards that we're not speaking damnation over people, but we're speaking encouragement. We're speaking life in their life. Amen. And even though their circumstances may not predict uh, or may not be what it should be at that very present time, we have to be careful as Christians that we don't condemn them for where they are, but we help to pick them up to get into a better place. Amen. We have to speak them into their destiny. Amen. We have to uh, let them know how God loves them and how God uh, wants the best for them and how God will do great things in their life. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now, today's lesson is coming from 2 Samuel, uh, the 7th chapter, uh, the 4th through the 16th verse. 1680 is that, that end portion of that scripture. Uh, the the uh, devotional reading came from Psalm 98, and our lesson is entitled "An Eternal Kingdom." An eternal kingdom. An eternal kingdom. If something is eternal, what is that? What does that mean? If something is eternal, is for what? Forever, right? So we're talking about an eternal uh, kingdom. Uh, the aim for change is by the end of the lesson we will recognize the significance of making God a major part of planning an inheritance for our descendants. What we do today, we do it for those who are coming behind us. Not necessarily for the very present time. Amen. We're making preparations for those who are coming behind us. Those who are uh, dependent upon us. Amen. Feel the need to keep uh, trusting God even when he denies our request. That's very key because there are so often times we get discouraged, we get frustrated because we haven't received what we are believing God for as of yet. So we have to be patient, amen, and allow God to take us through the process to get us to where we need to be, amen. Also, decide to seek God's heart and to be in his presence, which is so key, which is so key. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. But you can be separated from his presence. Amen? Not his love. You can't be separated from his love. But sin can separate us from his presence. And we want God to just... We want God to dwell in our life, right? We want the presence of God to be in this place, amen, to be in our life. Why do we want the presence of God? Because the Bible declares that the presence in the presence of God, there is fullness of joy, of joy. So in God's presence, there's no anxiety, there's no fear, there's no worry, but there is fullness of joy. 
This is why he tells us, and then we're going to jump into our lesson. This is why he tells us that he keeps us in perfect peace when our mind is stayed upon him. Because we're not concerned about what's going on beneath. We're in his presence. Our mind is captivated by his thoughts. And so it is, it, we, there's no room to be concerned about your worry, about your concern. You follow what I'm saying? And those of us who are connected to him, the Bible says he'll never leave you nor will he forsake you. The Bible declares that he is our very present help in a time of trouble. So if that be the case, no matter what we're faced with, we have to understand that God has provided a way for us to escape. Amen? He, uh, he's our provider. He's our help. In fact, the Bible says, oh man, I didn't went all the way. I'm getting to the eternal kingdom, but I want to bring us this encouragement today. The Bible declares that he is our shepherd. We shall not want. Amen? He leads us besides the path of steel waters. Amen? Listen, listen, it, it doesn't matter what is going on currently in our lives. If we hold on to the fact that God is a God above all, and he's in all, he can do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask for even faith. Amen? So it don't matter what we're struggling with, we have to understand that those things have come to get you from off the path of your faith. Am I talking to anybody this morning? God wants us to be so fixed on him being supreme and God overall, a God who can do more than enough. We have to understand if he is able uh, to form this world when the world was void, if he was able to set the sun in the sky and not burn us by day and set the moon in the sky to give us light by night, God, that same God is a God who can deal with our problems today, right now. He can deal with our insufficiencies. He can deal uh, with our setbacks. He can deal with where we are. Amen? Amen. Now let's look at First Samuel. Look at Second Samuel. Uh, just a, a quick note: First and Second Samuel, the author of First and Second Samuel, mostly out in, in um, is is unknown. Uh, most people say that Sam, some people say Samuel actually wrote uh, wrote the books, but he didn't actually. Uh, he probably gave information for 1 Samuel, his his first Samuel chapter one up to um, his part of his life. You know, he probably gave that information. But the author of First and Second Samuel is unknown. Uh, the text at hand, Second Samuel chapter seven. Actually, when we get to Second Samuel, we're dealing mainly with David's life. Uh, the, the, they may. Uh, uh, the, the David ancestry. We're, we're dealing with the life of David in 2 Samuel mostly. Uh, we, you know, first and second Samuel deals with about the 12th century down to about the 10th century uh, AD. Amen? Or BC, excuse me. Um, what we have to understand here uh, and to keep in mind says, and thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before the 2 Samuel 7 and 16. Let's read scripture here, 2 Samuel 7 and 4. But that same night the Lord said to Nathan, go and tell my, uh, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are, are you the one to build a house for me to live in? 2 Samuel chapter 7, when we first open up, David is having a discussion with Nathan. Nathan is a prophet who advised David along the way. There will always be a prophet in your life who will advise you <laughs> along your journey. Amen? And sometimes, amen, you know, the prophet, uh, you know, that's there to advise you have to give you some, some, there's some good news in most cases. He, well, everything. In all cases, the news is good, even if it's news to uh, that um, it looks like it's disciplinary action, but it's still good for you, amen? But David here uh, is talking uh, to Nathan. Nathan answers David before he goes and speaks to God. Uh, David says, hey, I'm looking at my palace. I'm looking at what I've achieved. I'm looking, I'm looking at what has been built for me, and it looks great. I mean, it's grand. It's beautiful. It's magnificent. 
But then he looks over and he sees the tent where the Ark of the Covenant resides. And he says, wait a minute, how is it that I'm living in this big old palace, this big old mansion? But then the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, is in a, up on the little tent. And so David now gets this great idea that he wants to build a house for God. He wants to build this magnificent house for God. Now, granted, his motive wasn't wrong, okay? His motive wasn't wrong. But the problem came in when he decided that that was something he wanted to do for God without being led to do. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? So Nathan here says in 7 and 4, um, when Nathan goes back and talks to the Lord, Nathan had, had sanctioned David's uh, uh, desire to build this big grandiose house for God. So, so he says here, but thou Satan, Nathan, the Lord said to Nathan, after Nathan had went back from the discussion he had with David, go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord has declared. Are you the one to build a house for me to live in? And it's, listen, I have been doing what I have done from since uh, Egypt when I brought your people out. I didn't have a house then. I had I was I was I was in this little tent then. And I, my presence was still with you. Why is it you want to put me in a place now? And so Nathan says to uh, David, he says, I have, well, excuse me, this is God still talking to Nathan. He says, I've never lived in the house, but I just said, <laughs> from the day I brought the Israelites out of Egypt until this very day, I have always moved, here it is, from one place to another with a tent and a tabernacle as my dwelling. Now, what's interesting here that I received from the study when I was studying the lesson that uh, oftentimes in life, most times, uh, people, uh, David wanted the people to recognize God for this, for beauty, for this great house, this great, uh, uh, you know, cedar and gold and all this stuff. And he wanted people to see God from that from that perspective. You know, God is in this house. But but God's like, look, I don't, it, it's not about, I'm, I'm bigger than being in, in a church. I'm bigger than a building. My presence, subs, my presence goes beyond a building. And you, what, was, what hit me is how some people will bypass this building because it's little, it's rocky, it's worn, and they will, they will seemingly have the idea in their mind that God is not here. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? And so they will think that God is in this, is, 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 you know, they'll associate God being in this big grandiose building. You know, uh, that's elaborate, and, and I'm not talking about, and, and I'm not talking about those kind of facilities because I believe we should give God our best. I do believe that, but the problem comes in is when you prejudge a place based on the outward appearance. Yeah, you know what I'm saying to me? Go ahead, brothers. Oh yes, I was noticed when I read about our prayer. When David spoke about building a house, yes. that same night the Lord spoke to Nathan about it, right? Uh -huh. And then after that, the Lord came when he told Nathan to go and tell David these things. And the Lord came to David and said, Are you the one to build me a house? Mm -hmm. Look like to me, the Lord was waiting on someone to choose mm -hmm. to help him and do things for him in a way like that. Mm -hmm. Well, according to the uh, commentary, um, the commentary says that in verse 4, we see typically a, uh, a, portent, a portent was declared by the use of the prophet form of the word of the Lord. Uh, he, he says here, I'm sorry, verse 5, excuse me, that, that's verse 5 you alluding to. 
Uh, the commentary says, uh, the pronoun thou, you, is most likely emphatic, indicating that uh, negation concerns the person's David rather than the action itself, the building of the temple. So in essence, while this question was about David and his intentions, it was also about God challenging the very notion that he can be contained in the house. It was, it was, the question came to, uh, as a challenge to David. You cannot contain me to a house. You can't contain me to a building. I'm beyond, in fact, the Bible declares that the temple of the Holy Ghost is where? In, the, in, in us, right? The kingdom is within us. We cannot, you cannot contain the very presence of God. You cannot uh, uh, denounce it to just, uh, or di diminish it to just a building. It's within us. So when we go to church, we bring the church to the building. Oh, y'all hear what I'm saying to you? And so it's important for us to let others understand that, listen, when you talk to me, you're talking to the church. This is why, and, and I love how the commentary do the, me, do the messages. This is why he gave the message about watching what you say before he gave the message about the kingdom and where it's located, the house of God. Because when I talk back to my brother, what we have to understand is we're talking down to the very presence of God. He said, what you do to the least of them, you've done it unto me. Why? Because I reside in them. I reside in them. You, you follow what I'm saying? That's why he says, be careful how you entertain strangers. Because you might be entertaining, what? An angel. <laughs> we have to treat, that's why he, that's why he says, we got to love our neighbors. And we have to, see, because the kingdom of God is with us, within us, God is love, right? We have to understand that we have to love people how God loves us. We got to love people that way. This is why it's important for us, amen, to lift them up instead of bring them, bringing them down. Because everybody's at different stages of their walk with Christ. You have babies, you have teenagers, and we never get to become adults. We all stay a child in, in, in God's eyes, amen? But we're at different levels of maturity in Him. And so because we are in different levels of maturity in Him, it's important for us, amen, to understand that people are going to be people. They're human, right? And they're going to make mistakes. Everybody is raised different. Everybody comes from different upbringings. Everybody is taught differently. And so it's up to us to have the mind of Christ when we're dealing with people here. Amen? We got to have the mind of Christ when we deal with people, period, point blank, period. And if you approach a person with the mindset that I'm going to, I'm going to think about them how Christ, and, and like Christ thinks about me. I'm not going to think about them from the standpoint of where they are, but I'm going to think about them from the standpoint of where Christ wants them to be. Oh, you hear what I'm saying to you? So I'm not looking at them in the flesh, I'm looking at them in the spirit in, in so many words. Are y'all hear what I'm saying? When you look at a person in the spirit and you, you don't see their flesh, then it, it what it does is it makes you, um, um, it makes, I want to say like a force field. <laughs> you know, if a force field, I don't know if y'all, well, I used to watch, uh, uh, what, what was that, they had that uh, cartoons a lot, I think it was, uh, uh, was that the had the force field? I can't remember the cartoon, but anyhow, the force field was designed so nothing could penetrate in. Are oh, y'all hear me? So now watch this. If you think of people and you approach people and you deal with people from the spirit and not from the flesh, it puts up like a force field for you. So if they do something that offends you, it won't harm you because you're not even looking at them in the flesh anyway. Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? It doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother you. 
Because you're not looking at him in the flesh anyway. <laughs> I'm looking at him in the spirit. Y'all follow what I'm saying to you? So I don't have to get upset with them and fight with them because I'm not dealing with them in the flesh. I'm dealing with them in the spirit. Amen. Praise God. All right. So verse, uh, verse 6. Watch what it says here. Uh, verse 7. Yet no matter where I have gone with the Israelites, I have never once complained to Israel's tribal leaders, the shepherds of my people Israel. I have never asked them, why haven't you built me a beautiful cedar house? Listen, I'm not, God said, look, I didn't ask them, I, I'm not asking you, nor did I ask the people before you to build me a house. I didn't ask you to do that. <laughs> And I love the fact that he lifted up the people that came before him because he could have easily asked them because, hey, listen, he brought them out of Egypt. He, he walked with them through the wilderness. He was with them when they crossed over Jordan. Now, I do remember him asking them to say, hey, uh, I, need, I need for you, when you get across this Jordan, to set me some stones up as a, remem as a reminder of who brought you over, how you got over, and as a reminder to your children that they don't forget about where they come from. But now once did he say, build me a big glorious house. Are y'all with me this morning? Now go say to my servant David, this is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I took you from tending sheep in the pasture and selected you to be the leader of my people Israel. In essence, he said to David, look, man, you were the least of them. I gathered you. I called you out from tending sheep to lead my people, not me in a place that the people worship the building versus worshiping relationship. It's about relationship. If you try to go and build this glorious building and say come to this place to worship God, then you are taking away the very element of relationship. Oh, Y'all hear what I'm saying to you? My relationship is with you, David. I came to you. I, I brought you from a place of lowliness. You were the least of your brethren. But I used you. And it was because of my relationship. Oh, Y'all hear me? And so, people of God, what we have to understand is that we cannot associate material things to God. You can't associate that stuff. It's a, it's a, it's a, obviously God gives us those things as benefits and blessings for serving Him. But when you, be, when you make that stuff God, you have just failed. You follow what I'm saying to you? David, look at David. Look at David's situation. David has accomplished great things. He's in a place of material wealth. He's living in the palace himself. He sees the material wealth that he has acquired himself. Based on what he sees, he's, he looks out, he sees uh, the Ark of the Covenant up under a tent, and all of a sudden now he wants to he wants to put his thought process of what he's thinking, he wants to associate that with God. He says, okay, I got a big cedar house. Let me make you a cedar house. Let me put gold in your house. Let me do all of this for you, for the people. And, and, and notice now, that's not a bad idea. On the offset, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to want to build God a beautiful house, right? Do y'all, I mean, how y'all feel about that? Yeah, that's a bad idea. Not a bad idea at all. But he wasn't led to. 
That wasn't fair. He God didn't instruct him to. He wasn't led, but he chose to, right? Yes. When he chose to, the Lord went along with that. And then the Lord was always waiting on him a house to be built because he had promised that he was going to have a house built for himself too, right? The Lord promised David. See, what David, David was trying to, see, David was trying to build God a house, but all along, God is trying to build our houses. That's what I'm talking about. Right. So, it, you know, it has a, he didn't need David to build him a house. Not and that's what you, 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 you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to build your house. You follow what I'm saying to you? Yep. So, uh, David, <laughs> that's, I think it was Jeremiah, maybe Jeremiah, I think it is, where many are the plans of men. We have these ideas of things we want to do. We get, you know, these great uh, ingenuities of uh, wanting to do uh, great exploits for God. And we think that we're, you know, every idea that comes to our mind that this is what, you know, possibly God wants us to do. But if you had prayed about it, amen, and God didn't sanction it, then it's just a great idea. <laughs> It will be destruction. God is not in it. It'll, it'll be frustrating because God didn't tell you to do that. It was just a great idea. Mm -hmm. Bro, Bush, man, bro, mm -hmm. Bush, man, you, you're a good fella, man. Mm -hmm. Man, you know what I think you should do? Man, I think you should go over there, man, and set you up in the studio and, man, just have the churches come to you. <laughs> That's a great idea. The Lord ain't whispered that in my ear. But God hadn't whispered that in your ear. Mm -mm. So you go out there on a great, you know what? Pastor Lowry is right. He must have heard from God. That's Pastor Lowry. <laughs> <laughs> but God didn't tell you that. That's right. You follow what I'm saying to you? So in the body of Christ, I, I gave that example to show you how we get twisted up, how we get messed up. And so what we have to understand is that it's about relationship. It's about each and every, in, let me say it this way, individual relationship. It's your own personal relationship with Christ. It's your own personal relationship. You have to develop your relationship with him by spending time with him, by praying, uh, by fasting. Uh, you have to develop the, that relationship, cultivate that relationship. Psalms 1 says, I meditate on God's.